I'm Jeff Moore, director of the Beckman Institute, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Smith Group JJR lecture. We're here today because of the vision of the Smith Group, the architectural firm that worked together with Ted Brown to put his vision in place. This was nearly 30 years ago that the design began to be put together, and it's created this groundbreaking center for research that has really helped us carve out new lines of research. The Smith Group created this lecture series in order to honor our visionary founding director, Theodore Ted Brown. And so we want to thank them for this opportunity. And in particular today, we have from the Smith Group, Andy Vizzano. We have uh, Rana Lee and Marty Stewart. So thank you very much for joining us. In just a minute, I'm going to invite Andy up. They've carved out one minute for Andy to tell us just briefly about some of the adventures that uh, took place in, in getting to where we are today. Um, but before I do that, I wanted to actually thank the Smith Group because it wasn't just a single building design that they put into place. They've been working with us continuously, even last year after the Smith Group lecture, and helped us reimagine how Beckman is going to remain relevant, not only getting to us this part to today, but, but to remain relevant going into the future. And that partnership is, uh, is something that really we're coming to appreciate and value even more now, I think, than ever. So thank you for that continued support. And Andy, I, I would like to hear, if you wouldn't mind, um, a few words from you at this point. Thanks. Well, thanks, Jeff. It's been an absolute pleasure in my career to be involved with this building as a very distinguished anchor in terms of interdisciplinary research. It was really a pioneer 30 years ago in terms of a concept that Ed Brown put together and put the prospectus together that led to the gift from Arnold Beckman of $40 million for this thing. So Arnold had one stipulation to the architectural team. I want to walk in the building in three years. So literally it set in motion, and I was in charge of doing the programming for this building. And they said, well, in order to walk in three years, you have to have the programming done in three months. But we have no idea what's going to go in the building, what groups are going to go in the building, what size the building is. We just know we've got to move. So with that, I put together a process called surrogate programming which literally looked at the technical requirements rather than who's going to go in the building, what are you going to do in the building possibly. So that was an approach that led me uh, really come up with the concept of uh, a very interdisciplinary, collaborative kind of laboratory. And it's been uh, an absolute pleasure in my career. Uh, it's led to many other uh, opportunities with us, both corporately at major universities around the country, where this became a lot of the a pioneering concept. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. As the flight attendant says, all right, it's time to fasten your seatbelts. <laughs> Insert the buckle into the holder like this. <laughs> It's really my pleasure to introduce uh, Sandra Singh Lowe, who, like uh, the innovation that's gone into this building, is an innovator in recognizing the importance that we all have in communicating our science to the general public. I had the opportunity to hear Sandra last summer when she spoke at um, HHMI Professors Conference, and literally I was blown away by her ability to deliver a crisp message in 90 seconds. It's, uh, it, it, you can actually find the uh, messages for yourself on her NPR podcast, The Lowdown on Science. And you'll get a sense of just what I mean, a, a very powerful message communicated to the general public about complex ideas that may be far from your field, but literally, I think, 
almost all of us could embrace and understand from the message that's being delivered. She's a physics graduate from Caltech and now the instructor in the Department of Drama at UC Irvine, where she leads a program in science communication. Sandra's been at the Beckman for the last three days. She's been conducting a workshop with our graduate students and uh, some of our postdoc fellows. I had uh, the chance to participate yesterday and listen to their 90-second lowdown on science, and they were absolutely fantastic. But I gotta tell you, there's one thing that really stood out above everything else. Their messages were great, but there was one thing that rose even above their messages to me, and it's something we need to learn how to do better. Um, and she brought this together. What it is that I saw is this amazing socialization that occurred in the last three days between about 50 or 60 of our graduate students and postdocs coming together, building an amazing bond uh, that really, even though the people had entered the building many times together over the last however many years that they've been coming here, hadn't really developed the kind of bond that I saw that came out of the workshop. And Sandra was able to really make that happen. And I'm pretty sure Luke is thinking that that's exactly what we, uh, what we accomplished. We met last night for a drink to be uh, uh, concluding and uh, heard their great presentations yesterday. And, uh, and so um, along those lines, uh, we now have the opportunity to be the lucky participants of what Sandra has to offer. I asked her specifically, so um, if there's any rotten tomatoes that need to be thrown, make sure they're thrown my way, and I'll tell you why. Because I asked her, Sandra, please come and critique our 60 Second Science videos and tell us how to do it better. <coughs> so with that, I'll invite Sandra to the stage. Thank you for being our speaker. for enjoying uh, my keynote before it actually started on my desktop. So let's see. So take 30 seconds, kind of like a man of black, and then do the kind of like you're going to go out of consciousness for a moment. As I, OK, good. OK, as I do this, we have, OK. Uh, you're in a dream. You're in a dream, not conscious. That's happening. Great. OK, there. That's what you should be seeing. Um, and welcome. Well, um, I hope you've come here today to enjoy my talk, the title of which is, actually, <laughs> what's wrong? Is there something wrong with the title of my talk? The group stating, oh, wow, okay, well, that's what's wrong with it, okay. Uh, okay, let me do that again as though we were already plugged in, because it's performance now, okay. okay. Uh, please enjoy my talk. This is where everything goes wrong. See, science communication is all about getting your video together and audio before you start. Okay. Welcome to my talk. <laughs> <laughs> Elucidating a diagnostic paradigm which is focused on utilizing methodologies in regards to the detection of proliferative <laughs> linguistic norms of diminished functionality in contemporary scientific communication. Applause for my title. Very polite. Okay. Now, obviously, it's a horrible title, and I think some of those words may be familiar, like the diagnostic paradigms, and and there's much to come. But elucidating. Why? Why is the word elucidating? Where did that come from? Okay. Well, I guess we'll explore later. Elucidate. Okay. The title of my talk is actually towards better 60 second slides. Um, so, as you know, um, I did a science communication workshop this week with some fantastic, fantastic Beckman Institute students. And we always talk, I'm often kind of like flown in from somewhere, moved in to, tell, to teach graduate students about science communication. It's typically not the professors or the chancellor, it's the graduate students. Because graduate students often start to realize that they would like to have better science communication skills. And usually they're about like three personal reasons. One is, you know, to give better talks at conferences. Sometimes the, the graduate student goes off to a conference and without really preparation or training has to give their first talk. And either that is the moment where in slow motion as the deer in the headlights is kind of like click, 
kick oh no ah panic went out or on the other side they felt they gave a really good talk and they goes I feel like you gave a pretty good talk and the advisor goes <laughs> you need to, yeah, you have to, no, you need to go figure out how to do that. Or you felt it so much that you gave a good talk that people didn't seem to understand it afterwards. And there's that first dawning of, oh no. And the second reason is to greatly enhance their corporate industry prospects. Often they've been a graduate student or a postdoc for many years, and then they get a call to go to that corporation or somewhere. So and they realize, like, in two weeks, five states away, they have to give a 40-minute talk to a room of 300 strangers, and they don't know how to do that, or don't know what to wear except for the logo to wrinkle to t-shirt that they wear. And the car in California, we have cargo shorts. You don't have these here, thank God. But they don't know what to wear, et cetera, et cetera, or how to do that in particular. Or I hear a lot just kind of like that the problem. I want to be able to convey this, give the excitement and enthusiasm of my work to my family. So I walk home at Thanksgiving and they said, what do you do at the Beckman Institute? And he said, well, Tom McGraw goes by Toss for me. And, like, and, then, and then you lost them about 30 seconds and then they kind of asked somebody else what they did and then you start to hate your family. Right? Because they, they just don't pay attention or they don't think your work is interesting and that can be frustrating. And also it's nice to be able to go to the pub and talk to someone over a beer about what you do without losing them etc um, etc et so here's this uh, this idea that I want to be, just be able to communicate what I do just in conversation to people so they get it because what's done here at the Beck Institute as you know it's 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 really important stuff it's, it's going to change the world it's groundbreaking but sometimes people it's hard to get them to get it pretty much right away. And of course, the little overhanging thing at this point with, I find, the younger generation of scientists is that they feel a little bit more urgency than maybe those in past generations to be able to communicate their science compellingly to regular people. Of course, the, the elephant in the room being, uh, let's see if my elephant shows up. Oh. Uh, 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 right, and then we're not even going to do, I mean, that's why we can all do like a four hour long retreat workshop this week and next week just to work out our feelings. And Stacey, it's only one slide. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, and then we're going to move on. It should take too much time. Uh, but as you know, kind of like young people become more politicized. I like this slide. Do what do we want? Evidence based science. What do we want? After peer review. What's the idea to march with it? It's really hard to tweet, but I get the after peer review. I like this one so bad. You introverts are here. Have you seen that before? Science March. How um, weird that is to have a science march that does that. But in the end, it's neither Democrat nor Republican. It's like pro science. We want to be able to talk about science in a better way. So, but meanwhile, so I'm trying to teach these young people, you know, science communication. Often we say science communication. Now that's a contradiction in terms. Ha 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 ha. But I think there's this idea in science communication that is it's almost a cliche, and it, it's maybe not entirely earned because some of our best, if you look at someone like Richard, Richard Feynman, he's a brilliant physicist and a fantastic communicator. But there is a little bit of the internal joke of like scientists aren't good communicators. And uh, do you know the joke about the extroverted mathematician? <laughs> Would you like to hear it? Yes. You have to really want it, Marina. I do. You do. Okay. <laughs> like, like you know that about it. Okay. So a mathematician, when a mathematician talks to you, he, he I'm sorry, he is the joke is he. He looks down at his shoes. When an extroverted mathematician talks to you, he looks down at your shoes. <laughs> Thank you. We here all week. We were here all week, and now we're leaving. Okay. So then, of course, that's the moment where your leader Jeff Moore kind of said, "Oh, good, and come here and make enemies in Illinois by talking about these 60 second videos." <laughs> and the irony is, that I had breakfast with Rohit this morning, and he's actually the best communicator ever. Like I told you, I, you were talking about the history of mechanical and civil engineering subjects. I've never really been that interested before. It was really compelling. So uh, I, you, you have offered yourself to be a very, you know, kind of willing to pick for this. And again, it was not my idea. So, <laughs> so I teach, it made me think a little bit about science academic culture. This is kind of like, I tell my students to do a little bit of a history postcard, which is kind of a glance backwards. So when I think of science and academic, scientific and academic culture, um, of, I kind of have that DNA, at least within me somewhere, because I am, uh, what am I? I'm actually Chinese German, you wouldn't be able to tell. I'm half Chinese, half German, sign Um And this is my father. Okay, there he is. Um, I just added that slide this morning. I don't know why. I see, like the dog. Like, I always thought of him. And some of you, some of you who are not blessed to have fathers.
fathers who are from Shanghai. Anyone has a father who's from Shanghai? Uh, yeah, well, no, well, and of course, Maeve is famously. <laughs> okay. And he was kind of like that excitable guy, the engineer, kind of like talked about things all the all, time. He was very excited about um, science, but probably was one of the worst science communicators that I would have ever heard about. Um, and he also wanted his children, um, he was that very traditional Chinese father that we know about. Now, Jeff Moore told me every Smith lecture has an Asian dad meme slide from the internet. <laughs> so they kind of expect it. So, lecture, so, so are you ready to see it? You got a real one at Marina. <laughs> I know, okay. So my dad was this guy. I just like to have this. Um, oh, this is a little bit purple, sorry. <laughs> Excited after dinner, he's kind of like, he was like a cat saying to mouse, like, who wants to do some math? No one. Okay. And it was at the time, I was born in '62, where the computer paper still had the holes on the side, and it had the lines on it, the green and white lines, and then the pencils would come out. And he was really interested in P and N junctions. I don't know why, uh, but he would he'd get so excited, and the pencil would fly around, and then at the end, he, he would say, so. Is it is the sign plus or minus? <laughs> right? And I my math is not as good as I think, but I it's about fifty percent chance of getting it. Right? <laughs> You're a young person. What is your name? Excuse me? Serene. Serene, and how old are you? Nine. Nine. Okay, so we're obviously way ahead of the curve here. So <laughs> welcome Serene. And anyone who gets the So what happens if it's a plus or minus, I have like a 50% chance of being right, right? It's really good. Well, somehow weird I would get it wrong at like every single time. Like plus or minus, and then would go like right to rage because he didn't understand what it felt like not to understand. So it wasn't that he didn't love science, he just didn't understand what it felt like to have that feeling in your head. So uh, and then but then as he got older, then I realized um, there was a whole thing of science colloquia. I hope you enjoy this as well. Um, where I realized at Cal we went uh, my home base is like Caltech and also UCLA, where there was a little bit of a a culture almost in academia where it was okay to have a science lecture that did not make sense to anyone. Right? And that was fine. And because nobody, yeah, and then afterwards there would be coffee and donuts, or perhaps before there would be the donuts. And then it was okay to be confused because it wasn't like anybody, anyone's life depended on it. On, I don't know how to put the buckles together in my seat belt. It was just kind of a, a cultural event that happened. And I knew that from the way that my dad, as he increasingly aged, kept going to lectures and then fall sleep in the front row of the lecture, pretty much in the nice warm lecture hall, as would other dudes. And I realized that my, my dad's generation, in kind of like in the 50s, were kind of, it was a cultural place to go, a little bit like, you know, kind of like um, going to the temple on whatever important Jewish holiday, again, I'm Lutheran, German, so I don't know, uh, you know, to listen, fall asleep and listen to the gentle, something like a Torah being read in Hebrew that you might not understand every word, but you have the gentle cadences flowing over you, and you know that all is well uh, in, in the academic, uh, which is basically what my dad did. There's a lot of falling asleep in lectures at Caltech, and that's the way we left it. So, um, I go, well, that's really charming. But now I'm back at UCI, I'm like teaching, so on communication. We really have a bad logo. I don't know if any of you have like a few that an answer. <laughs> just throw it in there. Maybe you have a good does Batman Institute have a mascot? No. Well yet what? <laughs> Jeff. It's because Jeff doesn't care enough. <laughs> So I think, you know, think about that. So, and I realized, okay, so I'm teaching my graduate students in science um, you know, how to communicate science better. And there's a little feeling that sometimes in academia there's some sort of examples of something that may not be the most understandable. So I did a little exercise in my own, and I would like, please give a hand for my sister, my own card. in every way, okay. And so I will let you know when to, when to play. So, and I gave, we're gonna try to coordinate this with music. It may not work out. I gave an assignment I like to call, okay, so start the music and try to play my mind. Sorry. 
script for my lectures. Do you recognize it? Something you don't know about it. This is an assignment I call. <laughs> the Ugly Slide Competition, where I ask students to bring in the ugliest slide they've ever seen in academia. 90% of the time it's from their own professor. <laughs> okay, it should be okay. Here's, for instance, okay. I'll continue with this thing. So what you're starting to see here is text. You can keep a play in the background. There's always not just way too much text, often different fonts. It's all crammed in one piece. It's often too small to even be seen. And especially, please enjoy the color. Look at these colors. There's kind of like a navy royal blue and a cherry pink. And I don't know if it's a very early version of PowerPoint where these were the go-to colors. And I'm going to show you another example in a moment of kind of like this sort of so different than what we usually see. And either those are the colors that somebody said, well, it's because scientists Students are bringing in uh, this part. <laughs> wow, it's so much clearer to me now. I'm glad you set it up that way, Professor. This not, it just visually it immediately makes sense. Um, I think that my students, not only were they kind of amazed at the uh, technical uh, degree of mastery it takes to get stuff to go on angles like that, they just kind of go into a dream and then kind of like, and why did you pick green? I don't know. So this is, but it's so much clearer to me now, right? Okay, a couple more here. Um, this one. <laughs> this, actually, there's a guy, and I hope not here, who does these on the internet. Like these are people use these slides as an example of like really good slides. But it's pretty. I don't know. It's like a really bad like action film or a video game or something really really terrifying. But no, it's science as we love it. Um, <laughs> Some people burst into tears when they see this, and it's kind of like, it's not even the worst looking one, but there's something about Corbet diagrams like religious electrical engineering that, that you really, you can get very disturbed by this one. Okay, I think there's two more. Wow! It's so clear to me now. I think that when, you say okay, there's different fonts, there's stuff you can't read it, and my students like, <laughs> no need to learn the details! <laughs> Oh, look at it again. Okay, what is this? It's somebody's head. It's a student head. 
we're in a classroom, a slide is being shown, the professor is sitting at the back of the room, took a photo of someone else's slide. But you see, very clearly credited down here in the black and dark. <laughs> University of Wisconsin-Madison, it's not really that important. So the professor took a photo of someone else's slide, and that's the slide. Some of you still don't get it, and you're going to get it at 2 in the morning. And you go, what? That's a pretty bad slide. So the point is, it became clear that, in, that when student, grad students want to learn science communication, they're not getting it from their own professors. And it's not that the professors mean ill. The professors are really busy writing grants, foundations, etc., etc., And they don't maybe have time to do a slide, and they already have tenure. So it's really not of their own personal benefit to make clear slides or to say, no, need to learn the details. This is really complicated. Um, so, so that is the culture that is they come from. So let's take a quick dip here before I go. And I also wanted to set up how many of us don't communicate science very well. So when I get to the 60 second videos, perhaps the intense is, is not just the Beckman Institute. In fact, you guys are on the forefront of this because you're talking about it. But in science culture and science academic culture, we know when you go to a talk, you know what you're going to expect to see. And I hope you enjoyed my animation there. Okay. So these are, as I said, what, what, what happens at the Beckman Institute stays at the Beckman Institute, <laughs> except for the fact that this is going to be videotaped and put on the internet. Aside from that, uh, UC Irvine, my own school, um, these were actual talk titles from a couple of years ago. <laughs> Optical trapping of dielectric nanoparticles by a plasmonically enhanced evanescent wave. <laughs> Does anybody know what that is? Okay, well, you, you're a professor here, of course you like, come on, come on, Jonathan, of course you are. And it broke heat, of course, you're a professor. You have to know, right? Okay, but maybe not so much. Okay. Cell type specific tracing of subcortical inputs to be one from the hypothalamus in mice. I know one word, mice. <laughs> Ion transport through manganese oxide mesorods reveals different charge states. Now, one thing that I like to do about this is actually show to really bright grad students uh, talk titles from their peers who are also science grad students. And most of the time, somebody from one field, bioengineering, does not know what uh, the other field is talking about, even in the titles. So chemistry, biology, electrical engineering, physics. So you kind of, I have an expectation now that somebody, even a graduate student in science, will not really understand exactly Exactly what's in that talk. But what's fun, I feel like I'm getting really, when somebody that is in physics, or another person in physics who's a grad student doesn't understand the title of the talk that's also in physics. And I think in this one, it was mesorods. Somehow, mesorods, they didn't know what a mesorod was. Does anyone know what a mesorod is? I can't remember. Oh, when you Google it, a rod, you know, the baseball player. I think it's baseball player. But so that even in physics, and then a couple more elucidating my favorite word ever, high resolution structures of amyloid. <laughs> and living words implicated in Alzheimer's disease, and then biodegradable anti inflammatory material, a novel protein conjugated polymer with applications of the medical, medical device here. Biomedical engineering, which is different from bioengineering, as we talked about today, this morning, which I just so this immediately just calls to mind science vocabulary. I think it's an important thing to be talking about at this point at a time where in science kind of the fields are becoming sort of narrower and narrower, except in Beckman where they're all coming back together again, where people are doing four different fields at one time. Um, but where people can't, and there's a reason for precision of language, but sometimes people can't understand what others are talking about at this point. So when you see a scientific paper come at you, it is just a, a barrage of language that often looks quite foreign. And I like to say, there's three different types for that one. I call it, the one, first type is hagfish ugly. It's something the hagfish. You know, like amyloid, you just see it on the page and you go, oh, I didn't know what that is. And then in proteins like the SNRP1301, where you just, and it has you know, some, some letters from other, other languages in them. So it, it's a, oh, you go like that. But at least you know that I don't know that word. At least you're clear that when your body is kind of trying to reject the words that you're seeing, you know why. It's good to eat, you know, the wrong pepper, chipotle pepper, or something like that. Okay. Um, and I think oligo, what's interesting is, of course, science language is kind of a mix of Latin and Greek 
and Golgi Apparati and Pirate Speak like State House of Cal. And you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson kind of has his favorite things about kind of the worst and best kind of scientific terminology, and I've asked my students uh, if you to guess which field in science he thinks, but has the worst terminology. I'll just jump forward. He thinks it's geol chemists always say chemistry, but no, uh, he thinks it's geology, which is mistranslated German like Orthoclase Feldspar. Okay, so it's not your field, so that's good. So you go, ah, it's not my field. He thinks actually physics has the best language, kind of like bing bang, dark matter, you know, that they, they have the best. But in this particular case, oligo, and it's like oligonucleotides, oligodendro, like oligo, it kind of means like a few, and that's kind of not what you think it should mean, because it sounds like so many other things. Oligo, it sounds like oily, it sounds like the Olive Garden, it sounds like <laughs> only the grandfather, so the old, the core, but it sounds like anything like what it actually means, and how I found interestingly is sometimes non-English speakers um, are far better at decoding this all the time than regular, than people who, not read, who have began English as a native language, because they don't have any resonances of what that might sound like in other words, they just immediately go to the technology, and they're much better at retaining this. The rest of us uh, who are English speakers who have a different tonality get confused. This is standard ugly. Okay, so this is uh, protein. What's wrong with protein? Like the word protein doesn't make us too, too scared, but the way that uh, scientists use it, we might not know what it means. I had a bunch of biomedical students always say, what is it, and they go, it's basically just a protein. Or they go, uh, it's just some small molecule. So, how about a medium-sized molecule? <laughs> How about a large molecule? Why are you saying small molecule? What does that mean to you within your field? And then you get to the deeper point, like if you're explaining to an outside person who's not in the field something about a protein, then you have to, then I go, sometimes I ask my students, define protein, what's a protein? What's a protein? And Aaron, you always go, it's, a chain of amino acids. <laughs> okay, I don't understand anything more than what you just said. It's kind of like, how can you define protein to say what it actually does, as opposed to just giving another definition that has other words in it that we don't know what that word is and what that word is that word. So the science language has a whole self-referential in and of itself thing that, that is impenetrable for people trying to know what it is. And then finally here, <clears throat> this is my favorite my fa it's like we're somehow in science. We have these unnecessarily verbose verbs and adjectives, like it, like elucidating. So elucid or like we say utilize instead of use, or we might say methodologies instead of methods. Except that those are two actual different things. Surprise, surprise! Methodologies is not just the longer way of saying method. It actually means a different thing. Who knew? Because sometimes they don't. But elucidating is this real scientific word that's used a lot, and one student in the mindset, well, I try to just do something else, like like explain, show, or something. And her own professor said, say elucidate, <laughs> because it's longer, right, Jonathan? It's kind of like it must, it must cost more money. It's longer, right, So it's kind of like, but then when you start stacking all these compound words and these long words together, that people who are starting to listen to it um, back up, they can't, they can't make sense of it. And these administrator words are unnecessarily so. And you're going to look at some of these words and say, well, that actually is, uh, but I'm just going to put these up there for a moment. And, and when you do your own talk, you can argue with me about these. Um, but they're, um, administrator words are general, abstract, there's no image of both, they're multisyllabic, they're dry sounds, they're abstract system words. And some things that we see, I'm sorry that Garrison Killer is still there. Uh, this was made before, you know, last year, but, um, and, and sometimes I'll ask my students to go, are there shorter words that you can use for things? And I always use Feynman as an example, that when Feynman talked about, like, uh, you know, atoms or molecules, it, instead of irregular motion, he would say, jiggle. They jiggle. It was because he was really confident um, and just always was trying to put stuff into smaller and, and smaller words that had more, more imagistic. And so, like, aggregate, constrained, increasing, elucidating, exacerbate, increasing, leveraging, perturbated, protective, suppressing, sometimes all at the same time. Um, and then I would say, well, let's take the word aggregate that we see a lot. What's the shorter word for aggregate? 
did I hear? This magic clunk. Yes, very good. So, so if it means the same thing, if, if you're talking to an outside person and trying to explain what you do, there's no reason to have to use the word aggregate instead of clunk because they're not going to go to another lab and recreate your results. <laughs> they're just trying to get the gist of what you're talking about. Things are bumping around. They're unstable. They're more stable. Whatever they they are, just to be aware of those types of words. So, and I just want to put a short plea out for the next generation. Even if you say, well, people can't master these words, they're not smart enough. I'm just my short take for the next generation. I know there's educational psychology here as well. That's my very sad daughter in middle school of just, this was her science. This was on the electromagnetic spectrum. She has to write a lot of stuff like this. She was very miserable. This was her chart. I said, what does this mean? She says, I don't know. I just, you know, copied it out of the book. Because right now, even today, you know, the, the brilliant science textbooks, and I, I charge, I charge the younger people here today who have a passion about science communication and education, that K-12 is still being taught science. You lose people in science. This happens in chemical biology, but it's, these textbooks are really long, they're really heavy. I would say even the new ones are, but even the old ones are, and most of the ones that are older are still in there. And, you know, there's 2D diagrams of 3D phenomena that just, ugh, really hard to visualize. There's so much text on a page. You know, so no one, you may say an academic, if my dad is an alumni is sleeping through uh, you know, a, a talk, that's fine. But this is kind of the younger generation, and they're already getting hit with this because no one's bothering to, to do this better. I think that that's a real issue. If they're testing reading comprehension and outlining and vocabulary, the vocabulary is like a foreign language, and they're still get, receiving this at the young age of middle school. So you all are experts, and you can hack your way through it. They don't really have the same luxury, especially if you're different dyslexic. So the other thing about this is that, which takes us to the 30 second videos, is let's say, I, I, I'll say, like, if you think like 50 years ago when I told my kids this and my kids this, if, if you said, you know what, in 50 years, cooking shows are going to be a big deal. And you go, I can't believe, I can't believe it. But then they, you go, yes, they are, because it's kind of like, if you see the Giada Italian cooking show, and there's a kitchen, and she welcomes you to uh, Christmas, and their Italian grandmother made this kind of pasta, and then you said, but she was in the old world, and she had this sort of pasta maker, we don't have those. And in the middle, they go, but now I have this kind of, I call it the cheese grater. Here's my cheese grater, it's a little bit of it, it's eight point something, blah, 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 blah. So you tell the technique of what you're doing after you introduce the fact. So, but of course scientists, uh, in scientific academic circles, you put the, you just put the cheese grater at the top, right? You know, Here's a cheese grater. <clears throat> Thank you. Just one of the things. You forgot the part about the Christmas and the family and the love and life and why we live in the universe. You know, just a few things like that. So that's why I, where I tend to say, please don't go with the cheese grater. Uh, so, and this is just one slide that I'm going through quickly. So, because we're getting to the middle. So I asked actually teach a short structure that's like this, where instead of the title be uh, talking about the technology or the device-y thing, as I think Rohit likes to say, you actually open with an opening question, puzzle, mystery, like when you do in your seminars, of, of why we want to know, set the context of why we want to know something, the real world problem, the issue, the puzzle, and then you go to the technology later. Okay. So, Look at this slide again. So I, I looked at what, like the lowdown on science. I wanted to read you one before we go to our 30 second videos because we have to do this in 90 seconds. And so on radio, as you'll see in a moment, because you can click away in your car, we have to, we're forced to ask an opening question in one sentence that's a puzzle. And you go, blah, 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 so that you don't click away to your Beyonce song um, for 90 seconds and that you will listen on. So I go, so we've done these for 14 years. It's a weekly show. It's a daily science radio minute. And so I go, I wonder how many University of Illinois things that we've done. Actually, quite a few. So I thought you'd share, and I go, this was a good one. So that I just found off the internet. So enjoy. Okay. Does moderate drinking cause fuzzy thinking? <laughs> this is Stanford C. Lowe with the lowdown on science, leading the fifth. But University of Illinois psychologists say moderate <coughs> drinking facilitates creative problem solving. In their study, 20 male social drinkers drank a vodka cranberry cocktail while watching the movie Ratatouille. <laughs> Winters are long in Illinois. <laughs> Don't worry, the researchers 
users were armed with breathalyzers, and the alcohol surveys were weight adjusted so subjects stayed just below the legal intoxication limit. Another 20 men watched the movie, but didn't get a cocktail or a snack. Rough. Part way through, both groups took a word association test. You're given three words and have to find a fourth that makes a two-word phrase with the others. So if the words are peach, arm, and tar, the answer is pit. I think I've had too much coffee to figure that one out. I'm sure with a beer I do better. How the guys do? On average, teetotalers got six right answers, while drinkers got nine. Drinkers were also faster on average, answering in 11 seconds to teetotalers 15. The team thinks drinking relaxes people's attention, letting them be less focused and so open to more ideas. Like thinking vodka goes with ratatouille. Please, it's a red wine dish. <laughs> but um, okay, so that's the end. Of that. So that's our radio. So now we turn to the 60 second science videos. And these are, please give a hand to our really impressive. And I was given these again by Jeff because I thought it was fantastic that your amazing institution even has 60 second videos. And Steve Great is, does an amazing job. It's kind of like, so that's my, before I go to the assignment that this man gave me. Okay. So as, as a way of introducing this, this is a bit of an unfair thing because in fact Steve will interview people for one or two hours and then afterwards just say, just tell about, just say something in 60 seconds. Go. And then he goes, thank you. So it's like, no editing, that you, it's just thrown at you at the last moment. And I, I, that's something that I think many professionals deal with today. It's kind of like, what's your job in 60 seconds? Like, how, tell people to come to the Beckman Institute in 60 seconds. Go. It's great. And it's like you're, you're starting. So it is kind of like, and as that matter of fact, people, all of you did an amazing job given what you were thrown. Um, but, and then we're going to look at how to do 60 seconds. <laughs> And here we go. Oh, no, 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 my visuals. This is, okay, here we go. Hi, my name is Rohit Bhargav. I'm a professor of bioengineering and a full-time member of the Beckman Institute. I'm also the director of the university's cancer center. So my lab is interested in developing a technology we call chemical imaging. Uh, we're all familiar with visible imaging, or, or normally, as we would call it, imaging with visible light. Uh, we're able to see the color and shape of objects with visible light, but we're not able to see what's inside them. We're not able to see the chemistry that might be present in an object. With chemical imaging, we're able to look at an object and not only see its shape and size, we're also able to see what the molecular composition of that object is. So we can understand what makes things work and perhaps why they're failing because of a change in their molecular composition. Uh, my lab develops the instruments and the computer programs that allow us to measure and make sense of the molecular composition. We use this in particular to look at cancers. We want to understand how cancers grow, especially with respect to the contribution of the tumor microenvironment to them. Pretty amazing, and also, actually, the words you do not use a lot of verbose. Actually, you, you use words that explain things really well. And again, you're a fantastic communicator. In any case, and that's what happens in 60 seconds. But then we go from shifting inward to shifting outward. So, say, if you're going to put a 60 second video <laughs> out there to the big old world, how might you make the message a little bit quicker? So, or a little bit more. Yeah. Okay. So what I've done is, so here's the transcription of what Rohit said, okay? And so you can see it's broken up. And so what you'll notice when you see this is I've broken it into 0 to 11 seconds, 12 to 53, and 54 to the end. And you'll see that all of these 60-second uh, videos have, have uh, well, they, they have slightly different structures. But um, mm. so I've outlined it all right. Okay. So I have a, a, a highlighting system that drives everyone absolutely nuts, but this is what I do. Okay, so I just kind of put <coughs> this in a couple of parts. So at the top, okay, I put this throw clear, it's not your fault, but it's kind of like, at the beginning of all Beckman's 60 second video, <coughs> it's so painful, Stacy, isn't it? But it's beautiful, and we all laugh at the end. It's kind of like, if you're in a 60 second video, hi, 
I'm Sandra Singlo, I'm the da 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 Advanced Technical Imaging at the Beckman Institute. Okay, it's pretty clear that it's at the Beckman Institute, because you can have that visual. So you now have spent 11 seconds just telling us your name and like the end of that. So out of your 60 seconds, you've opened by just announcing something that could be on the visual screen without grabbing, like bringing us in, okay? So, and you're nodding. So, so I would say don't have people introduce their name and the name of their life. I mean, that seems like a natural instinct, but in 60 seconds, in this world we live in, we would not open with that. And you don't work, unless your name is, yeah, uh, I don't know, Rip Van Winkle, or a really interesting name. Uh, although, as you say, it's kind of like just trying to these are proper names. It's not going to be a name that's, that sticks until later, until we know what you're up to. So the second part, Okay, so that, uh, it often goes, and, and, and as Romy just said, we're devicey, that uh, device like devicey at the Beckman Institute. So, of course, it makes sense to say we're working on like uh, one of 100 kinds of spectroscopy that's being looped here, or kinds of imaging that are being worked that they're going to save the world. But then this begins kind of an announcement of a, a lab technique or a device that you're working on, which again is going to be a little bit abstract to a regular public, to the non scientific public. <coughs> And then in pink, I have pink, I'm exciting pink, because there it is, cancer! Cancer! <laughs> you know, it's like open with cancer. I mean, even Republican senators are funding the NIH because they have granddaughters have cancer. So cancer wins. Cancer is, is Pepsi. And, um, it's like, hey, cancer! Cancer, yes. You know, everyone's in trouble. Like, so open with, even though it's in the name of your lab, just open with cancer. It's kind of like, I would say, cancer and puppies. So you're done. <laughs> cancer at the top. It's kind of like, I know you're ahead of some lab. I know you're into chemical imaging. I know it's better than visual imaging. Cancer. And you can see it comes at it's second 54 out of 60. And, and then the buzzer goes off. So I would say, if you're doing these, like, open with, open with cancer. Open with cancer. So it's suggesting, and this may be, I, I guess, my way through how to structure this one. It might be kind of like cancer. We're trying to, uh, I, I'm the hero. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm. We're trying to cure cancer. And sometimes I think we're not just imaging tumors. <coughs> we're curing, well, you're maybe not today, but you will. You're curing cancer, healing cancer, getting rid of cancer, not just imaging tumors. Imaging tumors is kind of like, what were you doing at the back of the Just imaging some tumors. <laughs> <laughs> we're curing cancer. We're the heroes. We're saving the world. Superman. I'm like, it's kind of like cancer. Um, that's what we're trying to cure it. Tumor growth remains mysterious. Still trying to figure that out. And you can tell me if I'm wrong and I can love it. Um, visible imaging is limited. We just see the outside. I was like, wow, chemical imaging sees chemical imaging. Oh my gosh. I always have people go like, do the wow. Do you be really excited? Because this is exciting. Chemical imaging. Wow. And then, Cancer is cured in 10 to 20 years. That's what you say. You know, I don't know what my results are. Could be never. We always call that in 20 years. Right? <laughs> <laughs> could be. Could happen. I don't know. But you know, they say that's the point is curing cancer, not imaging tumors. Although that will lead to that. Okay. Brought to you by the Beckman Institute. <laughs> blah blah blah. Cancer is a chemical image. I am Rohit. Right. The Beckman. Trust the Beckman Institute. So the cancer cures with all our spectroscopies. And you get to that good feeling. So then it opens with the Beckman Institute like that. But you say cancer, cool, chemical imaging, and we're the. And then it goes back and then you get that warm fuzzy feeling of the Beckman Institute. Those are the cool superheroes that solve world problems using. Imaging techniques. Okay. Uh. So my name is Justin Rose. I'm in the Department of Psychology, and I study behavioral neuroscience. I have, I run a lab that has both mice and fish. In the mouse lab, I'm mainly interested in how lifestyle factors such as exercise and nutrition impact the brain. I mean, one of the things we've learned in the last 20 years or so is just the incredible e efficiency of exercise at preventing cognitive decline. And um, if we can understand how um, exercise affects the brain and promotes uh, enhanced cognition, we can have a huge impact in communities. And with the fish, I'm interested in uh, studying anemone fish, 
um, otherwise known as NEMO. We have about 2,500 gallons of marine aquariums here at the Beckman Institute. And these fish are fascinating in the sense that they change sex. They start off male and become female. And I'm interested in studying how the brain orchestrates the sex change. Uh, is that, do I have to keep going for that? <laughs> And then promotes enhanced cognition is that sort of phrase that's a little bit promotes enhanced cognition could be a snappier phrase in terms of, of what you're saying. And then these, okay, and at 48, you get 48 about 60 seconds. These fish are fascinating in the sense that they change sex. What? <laughs> Our last and final one. 
I'm Cindy Fisher. I'm in the psychology department at the University of Illinois, and I study language acquisition in children between about one and five years old. Uh, we do a lot of projects on sentence interpretation, but one of the questions that interests me most is how very young children begin to assign meaning to words in sentences, how they integrate what they know about the world, their concepts of objects and events, with what they know about sentences, their concepts of nouns and verbs, and how they're combined into sentences. And one of the questions that interests me most is how it could be possible for simple but abstract aspects of the structure of sentences, the syntax of sentences, how the nouns and verbs are combined, could begin to affect how children interpret sentences, even before they've really learned that much about how the grammar of their language works. How could the structure of sentences be intrinsically meaningful to very young children, um, helping to push them in the direction of correct interpretations and new learning about the grammar? So charm, like so char I just want to listen. Her voice is so pleasant. When to listen to her, I love the, what intrigues me most. What's it, and she's so passionate about what she's doing. And, and um, so I think that's really compelling. That all, all the scientists, I think, himself, natively as people are inherited, inherently just personalities. Let's look at the death. Okay. So zero to nine. Uh, okay. Uh, introduction. 10 to 29, sentence interpretation, what they know about the world. One of the questions that interest me most in 30, the syntax of sentences. I should find her syntax is very delightful. It's just rolling and rolling syntax on how the structure of sentences can be intrinsically meaningful to very young children, helping them to push lessons in the direction of correct interpretations and new learning about the grammar. Okay, so here's what I would say here, which I would love. Okay, so there's the opening. And this is all in yellow. Okay, meaning that there's a lot of, it's a little bit hard. If you hear it for the first time, the syntax and the grammar and the sentence and the this and the other and the other, it's a little bit, it, it, you, you're kind of like receiving this information, it's flowing over you, but it's hard to say. Whereas, okay, so and we're talking about children who are between one and five years old and language, and if you're a parent, this resonates a lot. So all I would be looking for in trying to get at what she's talking about is something, as an example, right? An example of somebody saying something and then a kid doing something. And it's so simple, language is built for it to just don't describe this, the systematic syntax, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but just, so, so I'm looking for a simple example. This is so, I don't because I don't know this field. Picture this, a mom says, let's take the dog for a walk who to, her two-year-old told, here's her, then immediately puts a hat on a bunny. That's an example I just made up, but it is kind of like an example of kind of, let's take a walk, bunny means hat. You know, I don't, and that's completely wrong. I should, Cynthia could give it an actual true example, but that's what we're looking for. Just give a simple example of something that occurred, and what is more human, what's more compelling, what's more relatable. This is not even particle physics. This is speech from, this is a five-year-old understanding speech. So this is most well-tailored to something that would be that simple. And if you look at Oliver Sacks' work, like the man who was, took his wife for a hat, he is brilliant in essencing some of these neurological problems down to an example people can understand. He just took his wife for a hat. So let's say that's an example. If I, and again, I'm not an expert in this field. Um, seems odd. No, it's actually fashionable. There's a lot going on here when the kid puts the hat on the bike, whatever it is, okay? But, and so this is kind of the lead that went on. So I would say we tend to think of children grasping things like nouns and verbs. So we like people and actions. I want the dog, uh, hat is green, eating breakfast, I, mom will feed me, something like that. I, I think we tend to think that that's true. We, we like, mom, hungry, dead, hat red, et cetera, et cetera. Wow! Wow! suggests that construction of sentences contains its own, at nine years old, you know, this is really, your sentences are beautiful, we know that. <laughs> construction of sentences contains its own ineffable magic. It's the way sentences are put together. It's the origin of the word. It may be a preposition. 
You say preposition doesn't say what it is, because often we forget parts of speech. Like, you're saying that it's not just dogs, that there's something in the sentence it, itself that is, makes something magical go in. Some secret code is being delivered. Grammar is gone. I am amazing. <laughs> I don't know if you would say that, but it's like, you're going, wow, you mean grammar isn't just something technical? It's, it's actually a real thing that has its own language, its own language, its own code, its own music. And, and I am amazing. Just because she's the one doing it. Thanks to the background. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, and that is, and uh, that, that's the conclusion of my speech. I really thank you for bringing me here. I think that you're on the forefront of just so many exciting ideas, and there's no institute that would have someone come in and say, talk about our videos, and that's really amazing, and I had an awesome time being here, because you are saving the world. One image at a time. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. Opportunity, I think, maybe to connect with, with Sandra before she catches her flight out this afternoon. Um, we're going to conclude without any questions, I think, at this time. Of this with, with so we'll just have uh, informal QA. And, uh, and uh, thank you so much for attending the Smith Group lecture. And I want to say there's um, it's not too late to run upstairs to the tower room on the second floor and grab a, um, a talk that's being given by 21st century scientists. So if you have a moment um, and want to catch that, um, quickly uh, jump upstairs and you'll, you'll hear that. So thanks so much, Santa. That was really, that's exactly what we were looking for. And it was really uh, very uh, entertaining and delightfully presented. So thanks so much.